Welcome. Thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you this afternoon. And I want to really thank and shout out to the APDA, which has uh, supported this and also supported our Advanced Research Center at Washington University. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. I'd like to start off with my uh, financial disclosures because I think that's important, particularly since I was involved with the Institute of Medicine report on conflict of interest in medical research, education, and care. So these are important. As you can see, my relationships with uh, industry is zero. So let me tell you what I want to talk about today. I, I know what I was asked to talk about. I was asked to talk about advances in Parkinson's research. But what I think is particularly timely is to give you a little bit of information on how COVID uh, pandemic has affected research. Then I want to focus in on some of the causes of cognitive problems that develop in Parkinson's research, how, how we're addressing that and potential new treatments down the road. This is not a survey of all new drugs that can be done elsewhere, but this is really focusing on some specific research issues. First, let me give you some information about how COVID pandemic is affecting research. The first thing initially that is halted all face-to-face -face clinical studies. These are just starting to re-begin in the lab and mostly at this point now with what we call incidental research. And incidental research means people who are already coming to our center for uh, clinical care can at that time participate in research studies. And so that would be things done incidentally to their clinical care, which doesn't require them to come in at a separate time. It also initially stopped all lab work in the hospital uh, and in the medical campus, but that was very temporary and that is restarted and is going at a, a substantially increased pace at this point. I would really point out, however, that even when our face-to-face -face clinical studies were stopped and our research with people was stopped, and even when the lab research was stopped, research did not stop. In fact, at that point, even though people didn't come to the clinic or come to the medical school campus, they were working remotely. In fact, all my people were full-time busy. Uh, this gave us an opportunity to do additional data analysis increased writing of manuscripts to report our uh, research and actually resulted in increased grant submissions at that time. So we were incredibly busy. In fact, it really gave us the opportunity to do this data analysis and error checking in all of our work. And this is something that's difficult to do uh, on a regular basis when we're so busy collecting data. So Yes, there's twofold effects of COVID. Some things were uh, slowed a bit, but really research kept going at a fairly substantial pace. And now, as I hinted, we're moving forward. We are uh, reduced in our face-to-face, -face, but it is starting to move forward with this incidental work. Lab research has really come almost up to full go uh, for us, but we're maintaining social distancing and doing it appropriately. And of course, with clinical research, we have our personal protective uh, stuff like ma uh, masks, hand washing, face uh, things. So we're really minimizing the risk to any participants as well as to our research personnel. This is incredibly critical. So much for the COVID issues. Let me now move on to talk about some research. And just to set the stage for that, let's just briefly in one slide review Parkinson's disease. So most people are very well aware of the movement problems, tremor, slowness, stiffness, postural instability, falling, soft voice, that's well known. In addition, there can be psychiatric problems and those things include apathy or lack of motivation, anxiety, low mood or depression, or even seeing things that aren't there. Those are clustered in a group of things we call psychiatric problems, which can be different from cognitive or thinking problems. 
Now here we, I'm using some terms that seem more technical. Executive functioning really means doing things in a sequential fashion. So one thing after another, following directions. Visual spatial function is understanding where you are in the environment or knowing how to get from here to there. And those kinds of things are early thinking problems in people with Parkinson's and then eventually can develop dementia. So these issues with cognitive impairment that's what I want to focus on more because those are the components of Parkinson's disease. We really have no good treatments. We have a lot of medicines for the movement problems. We have deep brain stimulation for the movement problems. We have medicines for the psychiatric problems. We have none for the cognitive problems. And are these different spheres or areas of Parkinson's, are they distinct or are they overlapping? How does that fit together? So here's some research that's actually addressing that. A lot of times we group people or, or categorize people with Parkinson's into different subtypes, tremor predominant or falling and stiffness. And those can break up the groups of people with Parkinson's and give us some clue about their prognosis, but it doesn't describe maybe 30% of people. So it's not a very good way of, dis of distinguishing or categorizing people with Parkinson's. Whereas this particular study, that Megan Campbell in our office, in our group led, tries to distinguish people based upon their motor features, as well as their psychiatric features, as well as the cognitive problems. And these are the various kinds of features that were assessed. And you put all these together and we applied this to over 150 people. And we see that people, all, everybody has motor abnormalities, but some people who are mostly motor only, and that if we look at the right side of this graph, these are mostly motor manifestations, separate from the people who have cognitive difficulties, thinking problems and motor, or psychiatric problems and motor. So we seem to be able to separate those groups, and this can actually describe and classify 99% of people with Parkinson's. So it's a big advantage for classification, but does it matter? And here, what she did in following up this large cohort of people found that those who had motor and substantial cognitive problems had a higher risk for dementia and developed dementia quicker than those people who were motor only and psychiatric and motor, as well as a difference in mortality. So those people had motor only, here as we see in the green, hidden by my face, it you want to eliminate that, it's okay. It continues to go out here. They live longer than those people with motor and cognitive or motor and psychiatric manifestations. So these classifications are not only a way of classifying and categorizing people, but those classifications have importance as far as predicting prognosis. And these curves are what we call uh, uh, life expectancy or Kaplan Meyer curves, and it shows in time how often somebody develops dementia. So after 10 years, there's a big group of these people that have trouble with dementia, whereas by 10 years, a lot of people with these manifestations, psychiatric and motor and cognitive motor, die sooner than those with motor only. So that's the classification. Now, what's underlying this? What causes these kinds of cognitive problems? And then this is going to give you some clue as to how we're investigating this in some of our new research. Well, it's well known now, if we look at this picture, this is a side view of the brain. So if you take my head and you slice me right down the center and you turn me to the side and peel off this side and look from the side, that's what we're seeing here. This is toward the front of the head or toward the eyes, the back of the head. And this area is called the brain stem. And we have an abnormal protein called alpha-synuclein that's deposited in the lower part of the brainstem and moves up the brainstem. And when it hits this area, this is the midbrain, and this is now a cross-section through the midbrain, and somebody who didn't have Parkinson's, somebody that did, this is toward the front, this is toward the back, and you see this obvious loss of the dark melanin staining cells. These are the nigrostriatal neurons, these are the brain cells that make dopamine, and there's loss of dopamine, and it gives us a dopamine deficiency. 
So once the alpha synuclein reaches that part, then we develop the motor manifestations. But guess what? That alpha synuclein can also affect higher parts of the brain and get there, and that can interfere with thinking. In addition, when we hit this substantia nigra, which makes nerve cells, has the nerve cells, and let's just look over here. This is now a picture of that substantia nigra, and it has nerve cells here that send their connections higher up in the brain. Now, this is a picture, if you cut my face this way and pull my face off and look straight on, that's called a coronal section. We have the caudate and the putamen together, the striatum, and those are areas where these nigrostriatal nerve cells that produce dopamine go. So there's a deficiency of dopamine higher up. The point is that loss of nerve cells in the brainstem can cause loss of chemical messengers higher up in the brain. Is that important for Parkinson's disease? We'll come to that in a moment. So the causes of cognitive impairment that I want to talk to you about can be alpha-synuclein, this abnormal protein going in higher parts of the brain, neurotransmitter or chemical deficiencies, and I talked to you about the most commonly known one, dopamine, but we're going to talk about others, and network dysfunction, which you have no clue what I'm talking about, but I hope I'll make that clear in a moment and neuroinflammation and free radicals, which we'll come to at the end, and approaches to try to address these things, because this could be critically important in actually causing the death of nerve cells. So let's turn to our first analyses, trying to understand the role of these abnormal proteins in the brain. So let me start off by reminding you of what I used to teach that was wrong. I used to teach that when people with Parkinson's would develop dementia, real severe cognitive problems, that it was due to either the alpha-synuclein, as you see in pink, getting to higher parts of the brain, or coexisting Alzheimer's disease. Now, alpha-synuclein is the abnormal protein in Parkinson's. And in Alzheimer's disease, there's two abnormal proteins. One's called A-beta, and one is tau. And a number of years ago, now probably 14 or 15 years ago, there was a new PET tracer that we could use a PET scan to scan a person lying in the, in the PET scanner and identify whether they had abnormal A beta in the brain. Now we can also do tau, but back then this was the only one we could do. And we do not yet have a scan with alpha synuclein Although I'm not going to talk about this, just this past week, we're making substantial progress in a group of us working together across the country. And so if there are questions later, we can talk about that. But this original study permitted us to use the PET scan of A-beta. And the idea behind this study is if we put people in the scanner and measured their A-beta, if they had it, then maybe their cause of thinking problems or to predict their development of thinking problems would have been due to coexisting Alzheimer's disease. That was the idea. And so Erin Foster and Megan Campbell again, she's a theme throughout many of these studies, did these kinds of scans. And so this is a PET scan. It is a cross section to the brain. This would be toward the front of the head, the eyes, back of the head, the left ear and the right ear. And warmer colors here indicate more of this A beta amyloid in the brain that you see with uh, Alzheimer's disease. And here's a brain that doesn't have too much. We call this a PIB. That's the name of the pet tracer we use to identify amyloid. A PIB positive scan and a PIB negative scan. And the idea is both of these people had Parkinson's. The notion was this would indicate they have coexisting Alzheimer's. And when we looked at a group of people, at this point it was 207, now it's 300 actually, we would see people that were controls, healthy controls, or we would see people with Parkinson's with no thinking problems, mild thinking problems, more severe thinking problems, the risk of them having an abnormal positive PIB scan increased, but it wasn't all. Again, the thinking, our thinking, was that this would indicate Alzheimer's. Guess what? We were wrong again, and that's where we learned a lot. 
And the reason we learned that we were wrong is when people participated in the study, they did so until they no longer needed their brain. And then we examined their brain. And that was critical for understanding what we were actually measuring with PET. And it turned out everybody with Parkinson's who had thinking problems, every single one of them had abnormal alpha synuclein in the brain. 60% or so also had abnormal A beta, like you'd see in Alzheimer's disease. However, less than 5% had abnormal tau in addition to the A beta. So by the definition of pathologically of Alzheimer's disease, these people really didn't have it. And Alzheimer's was relatively uncommon in our group. Now, other people have done studies where it's a little bit higher or even much higher, but it's the majority of people with Parkinson's with thinking problems do not have coexisting Alzheimer's. They have some changes that are consistent with it, but it's really different. In fact, the distribution in the brain, the way the pattern appears is different in people with Parkinson's from those people with Alzheimer's. But does it matter? Next, so again, let's look at survival curves. In red, these are people who had died in our study and had abnormal alpha synuclein and A beta. And so you can see those people with abnormal alpha synuclein and A beta tended to die earlier than those people who had only alpha synuclein. And this is now the survival or from either the onset of their Parkinson's or the onset of their thinking problems. Either way, those people who had an additional abnormal protein, A beta, tended to have worse prognosis. Does that tell you A beta is causing the problem? Actually, it doesn't. And the reason it doesn't is we've also found in the brain that the A beta concentration really corresponds to the alpha-synuclein concentration. So it could just be a marker of more severe alpha-synuclein. Now, since we're taking people's brains that no longer need it, we did other measurements there. And this was another surprise. So we all know that people with Parkinson's disease have abnormal dopamine. It's really knocked down to heck. There's not much left. And that's main focus of a lot of the treatment, replace the missing dopamine. But when we looked in the brain and actually measured other neurotransmitters in the brain, one's called norepinephrine, another is serotonin, guess what? Norepinephrine's knocked down just as much as dopamine, and serotonin's knocked down not only in the parts of the brain where we see dopamine knocked out, but in higher parts of the brain. What does that mean? First of all, these are measurements made only one time in these people. Obviously, these are brain measurements made after a person's died. So that's when their Parkinson's is already really severe. So the question is, do these kinds of abnormalities occur earlier? And could these other chemical abnormalities, losses of norepinephrine or serotonin, actually become targets for treatment that could potentially help thinking problems. That would be totally radical. So what, how do we sort that out? So let me remind you, this is that brain stem. Remember alpha-synuclein starts down here. Well, it turns out the brain cells that make norepinephrine live down here and project way high up in the brain. Those that make serotonin live here and project way high up in the brain. And so these may be really early abnormalities in Parkinson's, whereas the dopamine is made in nerve cells here that projects higher into the brain. So these losses can produce chemical uh, losses here. So loss of the nerve cell here can reduce those chemical messengers out in the cortex. So how can we sort that out in life without getting additional brain samples? Well, here's a approach that we want to do and start implementing later this year as soon as the COVID crisis passes. There are actually PET measures of these other kinds of transmitter systems. And one is called MRB. So we can put somebody in a scanner and measure their norepinephrine transmitters or those nerve cells 
throughout the brain. And we can do it early in the course of people with Parkinson's. We can see if these specific abnormalities correspond with thinking problems of various types and do the same thing with serotonin. We plan to implement norepinephrine transporters later this year already, this calendar year, and the serotonin one next year and add it into our long-term PET studies. If we find these abnormalities earlier in the disease, if these abnormalities either correspond with these other kinds of behavioral changes like cognitive changes or predict them, now we've got a new target for treatment. And there are drugs that can help to address these kinds of problems. So that's a pretty hot area of research as far as I'm concerned. All right, let's take another step totally different than I told you I was going to talk about, and that's networks. This is a different kind of approach. This is lying in an MRI scanner. And when people lie in an MRI scanner, we can measure a signal called the bold signal. Now, you don't care what the bold signal is. It's a bunch of noise. And if you look at one particular part of the brain, when you're just lying there doing nothing, and you say you have a spot right here in the brain, you'll measure this signal over time. And we can measure three or 400 times, 300 times in five minutes. And you'll see this signal bounce up and down. The trick is, if you say, how is that signal in this part of the brain related, which looks all noisy, to the signals in other parts of the brain, it turns out there are other parts of the brain that are running in lockstep, like you're seeing here. And these parts of the brain that run in lockstep, they form what we call resting state networks. These are important parts of the brain that work together for specific functions in the brain. So let me give you an example of that very pertinent to Parkinson's disease. So if we look at Parkinson's disease with PET and use a tracer called Fluoridopa with PET, now I'm switching gears on you a little bit, that shows there's a deficiency. This is again a cross section through the brain, the front of the brain, the back of the brain. And there's loss of those dopamine nerve cells in the back part of the, caud of the caudate and the putamen, mostly in the putamen. And if we take an MRI scan and we make a region like this of over the caudate, and this is the anterior putamen and the posterior putamen, so different parts of this place that where dopamine is lost, and there's greater loss back here, less here, and, and here only when the disease gets to be more severe. If we look at that and then put somebody in a MRI scanner and put regions here and see how these regions are working in lockstep with other regions. In other words, what are their networks? We find this. So here is an image of the uh, left caudate, the anterior putamen, the posterior putamen, and these are in healthy controls. And this is just show showing the parts of the brain that are working together as one of those resting state networks in people that are healthy controls. And here's how it's working in Parkinson's, and here's the difference. And what we see is this huge change in the brain stem and a back of the brain we call the cerebellum. And it actually goes up through here. So this is what we call a resting state functional connectivity change that turns out the change here correlates with the severity of the motor symptoms of Parkinson's. But we can play this game not just with these specific parts of the brain, but with all parts of the brain and see how the entire brain is working. And when we do that, we get these cool colored maps of the brain and the colors indicate networks that are working together. So the red network works together, the green network works together. And when we do that, we can find a number of network changes that occur in people with Parkinson's. And this is a study where we took 107 people with Parkinson's who were not demented and healthy controls and we looked at how their changes uh, were different from Parkinson's disease. And we did a bunch of different studies. And here's the kinds of things that we found rather surprising. So instead of it being changes that are mostly just in the parts of the brain that deal with dopamine, we actually found the thalamus, a deep part of the brain, the back of the brain called the cerebellum, and visual parts of the brain and higher parts of the brain that have to do with motor function. These were very abnormal. And these dots here represent differences between Parkinson's and healthy controls. 
And so this is showing that the abnormalities in the brain are way beyond just the dopamine system. Again, more evidence, and this is now what we call resting state network evidence of dysfunction. So how does that relate to everything else? So Megan Campbell, here she goes again, looked at the strength of some of these networks. And this is a network called the somatomotor network. And this is the dorsal attention network. It has to do with cognition. This is more to do with motor. And the strength of those networks correlates with the amount of alpha-synuclein we actually measured in the spinal fluid in these people. Now, this is evidence that the resting state networks directly relate to the degree of pathology with alpha-synuclein in the spinal fluid, which we think reflects what's going on in the brain itself. The spinal fluid bathes the brain, so that gives us an idea. And in fact, if we look at connections between different resting state networks, in this case, it's called the dorsal attention network to the frontal, frontal uh, parietal control network. You don't need the specifics, but these are network changes that are going on in the brain. People who have changes in their thinking have, can be predicted by changes in these networks. And so now we're showing network abnormalities predict subsequent declines in cognition. So how do we treat this? Well, now I'm gonna to totally shift gears and end up with just a couple of slides about this. This person is Laura Dugan. She's not even a neurologist but she's a great neuroscientist. She's a geriatrician and specializes in uh, internal medicine of older people. She was in our department a number of years ago and she invented, synthesized this molecule. This is way cool. So this molecule is composed of 60 carbon atoms with a bunch of these guys stuck on it. And I'll talk about these guys. The shape of this molecule is kind of like a soccer ball. The reason I'm showing you this, and if you don't know what this is, you haven't been to St. Louis or traveled in St. Louis, this is the Climatron in the Missouri Botanical Gardens. And the Climatron in the B Missouri Botanical Gardens holds or able to have a whole number of different uh, of microclimates in the world. But the structure here was invented by an architect called uh, Buckminster Fuller. Why do I tell you that? Well, it's important to be well-rounded but it's also important for your biochemistry education because this kind of molecule that has the kind of the shape of this geodesic dome are called Buckminster fullerenes after the architect or fullerenes for short. And what she did is she threw a bunch of uh, chemicals or molecules on here, atoms on here are called carboxyl groups. And it turns out that was a huge difference. This drug she made, called, we call carboxyfullerene, or C3 for short, because C1 and C2 didn't work, C3, turns out to be the most potent free radical scavenger and can knock down neuroinflammation in the brain we've ever had. And what we did, we had an animal model of Parkinson's, and we gave a bunch of animals uh, this Parkinson's starting here, and we followed them. And typically what they do is they develop Parkinson's over three or four weeks. After we gave this drug that causes the Parkinson's, then we started them on treatment with carboxyfullerene. And here's the trick. Nobody at WashU knew which animal had which. We were blinded. And Laura Dugan, who made up these uh, capsules as the way we gave the medicine, was no longer here at WashU. She's now at Vanderbilt. And she would fill them up with either the real stuff or food coloring and send them to us. And I still don't know. And I published this stuff six years ago. And it turned out what we saw when we put the data in two groups and send it to a biostatistician who had no idea what we we're doing, we found this crazy thing. These animals that were treated with the C3 got better. And what I'm saying better here, this is a measure of clinical Parkinsonism. I'd never seen this. Typically the animals just stay the same or get a little bit worse over time. This was really amazing. So behaviorally, the motor symptoms improved. And if we used PET to measure these nerve cells and the animals that got the uh, placebo or no treatment, they were knocked down. This is the baseline of the two groups were the same after the MPTP, this is way knocked down. Those that got the carboxyfluorine, they weren't normal, but they were much better. 
And we measured the same thing with a different kind of PET scanner, also the improvement. And when we did the motor scoring, obviously this is much better, this is less severe. And when we actually measure the dopamine in the brain, there's way more dopamine in the animals that were treated than the ones that had placebo. So how the heck does this work? And when I published this, we had companies wanted to put this in a human trial, but I said, no. And the reason I said no, is I wanted to make sure, and I've been involved with drug studies for 30 years in Parkinson's, and none of them have worked to slow the progression of the disease. And we want to do better. And the way we wanted to make it better is we wanted to be able to measure how this was getting into the brain and was it hitting the target in the brain in the way we thought. And here's what we did. We designed a study to take animals, give them the MPTP again. This is the drug that causes Parkinsonism treat them with either carboxyfullerene or placebo, but here's the trick. Now we wanted to measure neuroinflammation in the brain and what we call reactive oxygen species using PET scans. And there weren't really good measures in it. There were some that they weren't as good as I wanted. So we wanted to test new measures. And so we're gonna do that to see if we can detect those changes produced by our drug and then whether this carboxyfullerene engages those targets, reduces the degree of neuroinflammation, and then compare it with the measures we make in the brain. And so that's what we're doing. So here's an animal we've given MPTP. Now this is one of those sections. This is the top of the head, the bottom of the head, the left and the right. We inject it over here, and this is this measure of dopamine neurons, and we see we, the drug that we give knocks out those dopamine neurons. But what's going on up here? This is the surprise. These are our three different PET measures that we were wanted to try to see if we could find evidence of inflammation in the brain or reactive oxygen species. And what happens is there's a delayed response higher in the brain, it's now thinking parts of the brain, where we see these huge inflammatory responses as if inflammation may contribute to the death or dysfunction of nerve cells in higher brain that may have to do with thinking. So it's now possible if carboxyfullerene can knock this down, that would be another way of trying to reduce cortical or cognitive problems. So this is the fourth way we think there could be cognitive problems. Way one, alpha-synuclein. Way two, loss of chemical messengers not just dopamine, but serotonin or norepinephrine. Way three, network changes because you knock out different parts of the brain that causes other parts of the brain not to work right because parts of the brain work together. And now four, there might be neuroinflammation going on. And there's a lot of other evidence to support this. So carboxyfullerene might be able to hit the real mechanism of what's causing problems. I've talked long enough. Most of the work, I'm talking about done by all these other people and they're an incredible group that I'm very lucky to be able to work with. And again, I wanna thank the APDA for all of their support and they've done a terrific job with us. Thank you very much. Hi, thank you very much for joining us for this Congress. It's a delight to have everybody here. Sorry, my hair is a little bit of a mess. I didn't expect my camera to be so good on my, my iPad. Anyway, thank you again for the APDA for sponsoring this and joining the Midwest uh, Congress, who is joining the Midwest group and the St. Louis group for uh, bringing you this uh, program. Uh, well, I have a whole bunch of questions that have uh, been sent to me through chat and I'd like to try to address some of those. And first, there's a uh, question about, from uh, the person called Anonymous. It's a very common name I'm seeing among some of these questions. And the question was, can we determine the amount of alpha-synuclein a person has? And the answer to that is, we can in certain ways and we cannot in other ways. So let me be more specific. 
what we want to know, know is the amount of alpha synuclein in the brain. And we currently, the only way we can do that is to actually take the brain out when somebody no longer needs it, that is after they die, and we can chemically measure the amount of alpha synuclein. A big focus of research, which I did not discuss here, but we're involved very seriously in, is developing a PET tracer that can actually directly measure alpha synuclein in the brain. And NIH is sponsoring this research, and we're uh, working together with people at the University of Pennsylvania. This is run by a guy there called Bob Mack, a radiochemist uh, who used to be at Washington University, and we're working with people at Yale and UCSF, University of California at San Francisco, and us at WashU, and people at Penn. Uh, uh, so this group is all working together, and we're coming close to being able to do that. What we are doing now, and because we cannot yet measure it directly in the brain with PET, is we can measure it in the spinal fluid. And that's done by taking a spinal tap, and we can take that fluid and actually quantify the amount of alpha synuclein. That would be an indirect measure of the total amount going on in the brain, but it doesn't tell us the amount in specific areas of the brain, and that, in fact, may be critical. So to answer your question is, we can indirectly measure alpha synuclein, not yet directly in the brain, but we are making major headway in that. The next question is, <clears throat> when is it, <laughs> this is an interesting, when is it time to change from my neurologist? to a movement disorder specialist? Tough question. So first of all, we have, let me address where the data really lie for this. So there was a paper published by uh, Allison Willis. <clears throat> At the time, she was a fellow here at WashU with uh, Brad Reset, And they looked at the outcome, and the outcome meaning the length of uh, life as well as the risk of ending up in a residential care facility or breaking your hip. So in other words, bad outcomes or of uh, progression of Parkinson's and looked at it in people who are treated by their primary care doctor versus those who are treated by their neurologist. And this was all based on people that were um, eligible for Medicare because it was all based upon Medicare records. So it's limited to people who are 65 and older mostly. And what they found is that people who were treated by neurologists did substantially better. They lived longer, they had better quality of life, and they ended up in a nursing home uh, much, much less. But you're really asking, is it better to see a movement disorder specialist? Well, I'm incredibly biased. I'm a movement disorder specialist, and I would say that's probably better. We have a lot more training, and I train a lot of people to do that kind of thing. But I don't have data to prove that. Um, then the other side of that coin is how many movement disorder specialists are available and, and can you get in? So the first answer is definitely see a neurologist and not just your primary care physician. And if you're able to see a movement disorder specialist, probably the sooner the better. And one reason for that is then you'll know about other research studies that are going on. And if you're interested in participating, you'll be able to do that. Let me go to another question. So there was, does age of onset play a role here? This is uh, sent in by Karen Frank. And what about genetic subtypes? And so I believe Karen was referring to the uh, studies that I was showing really at the beginning of my presentation, showing that there's different uh, subcategories of Parkinson's. We can define it by those who have predominantly motor only or mostly motor motor and cognitive, which is thinking problems, or motor and psychiatric, which means motor and things like depression or anxiety or seeing things that aren't there, hallucinations. And those groups make a substantial difference in uh, the outcome as far as length of life and a risk of developing dementia, substantial cognitive problems. But the real issue is is that different in younger people? Because somebody asked that. And we don't know that yet. This study was really a cross-section of ages of onset of Parkinson's and people, all comers, and then following them through. Uh, the other part is, does genetics contribute to that? And in our study, we uh, did not find that there was a major influence of genetics, although there was some influence by 
the genetics for something we call APOE, which does have a slight increase in a certain kind of APOE that increases your risk of developing dementia. And then to follow up on that, let me just uh, scroll down on the questions because there's one that was very similar to that. Uh, and this is from Miriam. Uh, well, well, I'm going to skip to Miriam's question. I'll give you Miriam's question. I'll come back to the other one when I find it in a minute. Miriam asks, my husband has a diagnosis of Parkinson's like condition. How is that diagnosed and what does the future look like for that condition? Well, first of all, Miriam, Parkinson's like conditions can be many different conditions. So it's hard for me to predict exactly what his prognosis is. It really depends upon what other condition is being referred to. And there are many, many different Parkinson's like conditions. So uh, that would be the major factor. And how do you make that diagnosis? Currently, we dis, uh, diagnose these Parkinson's-like conditions clinically by their manifestations, how they appear, uh, certain problems like eye movement problems or stiffness in the neck more than in the limbs or early falling, things like that that help us. But they're not absolute. And so one of the other things that there, we're doing in our research is trying to identify the different signatures in the brain that may identify these other conditions. And so, for example, alpha-synuclein, which we see in people with Parkinson's, is not the same abnormal protein that we see in people, for example, with uh, progressive supranuclear palsy or PSP, another Parkinson's-like condition. That condition has tau, a certain kind of tau, we call 4R tau. And so if we could develop a tracer, pet tracer for 4R tau, and one for alpha synuclein, then in the future that might help us to make those diagnoses. But right now it's a clinical diagnosis and there is substantial overlap. As I say, the best Parkinsonologists are 100% accurate in their clinical diagnosis, but those are doctors who don't check brains afterwards. Those of us who actually check it recognize that the overlap among clinical manifestations is really substantial. And that leads me to another question sent in by our favorite friend, Anonymous. And that is, how often should a person with PD have a brain scan? And how often? So the first question is, should they have a brain scan at all? And the second question is, what kind of brain scan if they have a, uh, uh, should they have? Because there are different kinds. There's MRI scans, there's CAT scans, there's SPECT scans, and there's PET scans. And all the stuff I was talking about was mostly with PET and the resting state stuff with, was with MR. What's done clinically most of the time is an MRI scan to look and identify whether there are other manifestations in the brain that cause symptoms similar to Parkinson's. Because there's not really... Uh, manifestations on an MRI scan that would be specific for Parkinson's disease. So to answer your question for Parkinson's disease, you don't really need it, but you're use it, it's sometimes done to exclude other conditions. As far as long-term follow-up, absolutely not needed unless something changes, makes uh, your physician or you suspect something else other than Parkinson's disease is going on. There's more commonly done what we call a SPECT DAT scan. And that's a scan that looks at uh, dopaminergic neurons in the brain. And some people use that to help confirm a diagnosis of Parkinson's. Now you're talking to somebody who's incredibly biased about that. And that is, I'm somebody who's done neuroimaging research for 38 years. And I have never ordered a DAT scan clinically for a patient. Now that puts me as an outlier. And the reason for that is a DAT scan can show abnormalities in this dopamine neurons, but that you can see in other Parkinsonian-like conditions. And so it doesn't really help me in taking care of a person. Uh, that's my bias. If I want to know if they have uh, Parkinson's and I want to know if they respond to medicine, what I do is I give them medicine because that's really the question. So I don't do repeated uh, scans on people. Let's move forward. Uh, do brain, another one from Anonymous, do brain exercises have a long-term effect on reducing cognitive issues? What a great question. And the simple answer to that is we don't know the answer, but there's increasing data about 
exercising, improving the motor manifestations, actually improving quality of life as well. Uh, so I would not say no to this. I say we don't know because we haven't studied it adequately. And I see no downside in exercise and a healthy exercise plan. And everybody with Parkinson's should have an exercise plan that includes not only stretching, which is good, but also strengthening and working together with a therapist to develop a plan for you. And that by that, I mean a physical therapist that you can then carry out on your own or with your uh, helpers is a great idea. And I think that should continue on. Uh, here's another question. Let me move on. Um, ah, yeah. My, uh, this is from SES, and it says, my uh, person with Parkinson's has all three sets of symptoms. You seem to indicate this is unusual. And I believe the three sets of symptoms that you're referring to are the motor, the cognitive, and the psychiatric. And uh, that's a great question. And I really wanted to discuss that earlier, and I, I didn't s slip down to it. And the point is, in our study, what we were looking at is how people are when they begin and through the middle stages of Parkinson's. But your point is really absolutely critical that we asked ourselves, what we are, the subtypes we see just stages or are they something that's really important when it goes to following people for a longer period of time? And the simple answer to you is, if people live a very long time, and you're absolutely right, they frequently and most commonly develop all three manifestations. But how they get there and the rate at which they get there seems to be very different based upon our three subcategories. So yes, I'm not surprised that your loved one, uh, the person with Parkinson's has all three, and we see that commonly as the disease has progressed more. All right, let me go to the, another question and another one from Anonymous. What can you do to stem the loss of thinking problems? That's the whole point of my entire presentation. Most of Parkinson's research has focused on treating the motor manifestations, L-DOPA, drugs like that, deep brain stimulation, which can help the motor manifestations, does not help the thinking problems, in fact, can impair it. Uh, so we need other approaches, and that's the whole point of our carboxyfullerene and other avenues of research that are trying to reduce the spread and severity of alpha-synuclein in the brain. And I think also some of our findings showing that there are other chemical messengers lost in the brain like norepinephrine and serotonin, and thinking about designing studies to see if trying to replace those uh, neurotransmitters that are deficient in Parkinson's can help thinking is exactly the direction we need to go. Because in my opinion, the biggest problem with Parkinson's today, the biggest unmet need, need is the cognitive impairment that we're not so good at uh, treating at all. In fact, we're not good at it in any shape or form. SES asks another question, is there a way to get involved in human trials for carboxyfullerene getting on a list now for when it will happen? And the answer is the way you can get involved is you can support your local researchers. Uh, you can always volunteer to participate. And right now, uh, the real answer is uh, we're not ready to try this in people with Parkinson's. We're hoping by early next year, we're going to try it in healthy controls to make sure this drug is in fact safe for humans. This could be a total wash, but it could be pretty darn big. And then fairly soon after that, we're going to start. And we probably will start with milder, earlier PD, people with PD, because that will be uh, easier for us to detect changes. So that's how we're going to go forward with that. Uh, let's see. And one more. I guess that was the last question, since my questions have gone away. I really want to thank you for your attention and everybody for, for participating in this uh, series of lectures. I look forward to the other ones coming up. Thank you so much.